Bavarian Motorworks BMW, one of the most popular car brands in the entire world. I love to talk about the most channel, they always turn up in my videos. Today I'm gonna to talk you through five special ones in particular that I think are great value for money right now. So if you like this video and want to see more like it, do hit the like button and let me know in the comments down below what brand I should do next. Subscribe as well if you're new know that video, let's get straight into it. <laughs> Let's get started with the oldest car on the list, the BMW 2002, which is a well-loved classic car, but possibly more importantly, has something quite special about it. It's the predecessor to the many generations of BMW 3 Series that we've seen ever since. It comes with a 2.0-litre inline-four engine, making just 128 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 9.6 seconds. Of course, not very quick, but for the mid-1970s, that was pretty sporty performance, and with this lovely coupe executive styling that it has, it definitely captured the imaginations of car-loving business people in the Western world in particular. Particular. It arrived because in the 1960s, executive cars were considered to be relatively big, and BMW recognised that not everyone who used an executive car for commuting needed something big, and might like something a little bit sportier. That's how the early O2 series cars came to exist, and the 2002 was the most powerful, largest engined model, other than the 2002 Turbo, which is among the most sought-after classic BMWs right now. That's partly because it was Europe and BMW's first turbocharged production car ever. Pretty crazy. But the standard 2002 came as a convertible, Targa, hatchback, and a special cheaper version too, and the name is actually pretty interesting. The 20 stands for the engine displacement, and the O2 stands for the number of doors the car has. What's amazing is that despite its age, these were known to be really good cars from a handling perspective, as they're super lightweight, coming in at under a thousand kilograms, with those really small dimensions, and of course, a bit of 1970s simplicity. These are pretty hard to come by, but I found a few which probably need a bit of classic car love, starting at around the 16,500 pounds mark and they can go up to insane prices for the best kept examples. Unfortunately with these, rust or corrosion is the biggest cause of death. If you're in the market for one, like buying an MX-5, you really need to get under it to take a look at how rusty it is. It will cost you a fortune to restore a rotted one of these given you'll need to go to a specialist to get the relevant parts to put it back together. The BMW M1 is one of the coolest BMWs to have ever existed with its entirely different, more supercar-esque cheese wedge styling that is really set apart from most other BMWs. And I say most because two of these similarly styled BMWs appear in this video, starting with this, the BMW 840ci, which ran from 1990 through to 1999, with two different engines over that period. The later engine was the 4.4 litre V8, which produces 286 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 6.7 seconds, not bad at all for a 90s sporty Grand Tour that lays no claim to being a supercar by any means. It did also come as a V12, but the V8 is definitely more than enough engine for the money, especially in a car of this size and still gives you that same Grand Tourer experience as well as the stunning looks of the E31. The only particularly cool thing about that V12 is that it was the first V12 engine mated to a six-speed manual transmission on any production road car. It was originally designed between 1981 and 1986, but BMW opted to delay the production of it until sales of the 6 Series began to wane as they didn't want to erode that car's success. The E31 in modern money had almost $900 million spent on development, including a bunch of time in wind tunnels to decrease drag coefficient as much as possible. The main complaint early doors though was that though the car looks like a baby supercar, it didn't handle like one, as most were specced with a bunch of luxury items that added weight to the car and made it a bit more of a boat than it needed to be. These run you around £12,000 at the bottom end, and generally you'll find some nice 1998 examples at around the 20 k mark. One of the main problems you'll find on these is the shimmies, which is generally a telling sign that the steering and suspension need some TLC. The cooling system is known to be weak around the radiator, and there are a few oil leaks as well, plus a bunch of other bits to note. Luckily, as it's already a cherished classic car, there are loads of guides on how to keep these well maintained. Recently, we saw the introduction of the BMW M3 Touring, which I personally absolutely love as a major estate fan, partially because it's a properly nice looking car, and partially because I love the history of the 3 Series Touring being built in one of BMW's engineers' sheds before becoming a factory offering. Now, sadly, the E90 Generation M3 with the V8 didn't get a Touring example, but its stablemate, the E60 M5, did, and it's an absolute monster for the money. It comes with a 5 litre V10, which produces 499 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 4.6 seconds, which is pretty sick for a large estate, especially when you think that engine came from BMW's involvement with the Sauber F1 team, showing they could really build a lovely sounding F1 inspired V10 for the roads. The M5 arrived two years after the 5 Series began production, and the Touring was only sold in Europe, which is interesting as the US was the M5's largest market by a very long 
long way. They did get the manual transmission option though which we didn't get in Europe, so swings and roundabouts. Altogether there were just 1,025 tourings built versus 20,589 saloons which is what makes this estate such a sought after car today where the saloon is a future classic I feel like the touring might already be there. This is one of the best sounding BMWs ever in my opinion and with that B10 engine under the bonnet you really are buying into something special. Compared with the saloon these are way more expensive starting around the 30k mark and they're pretty hard to find. At the time of recording there are just three on Auto Trader, and they're all 30k. Unfortunately I've seen a few owners calling these glass cannons and I actually know a couple of people who have the non-touring examples and though they do love their cars they almost always have stories of horrendous bills trying to repair or maintain them. The main known issues are with the rod bearings, high pressure Vanos oil pump and oil line, fuel filter and pump injectors and the SMG gearbox which is known to be one of the most aggressive of all the issues. So I hope you guys are enjoying this video, if you are then do hit the like button and subscribe as well if you're new and as I said at the start of the video, let me know in the comments down below what brand I should do next, I'm Porsche, I've done BMW, what would you want to see next? I said there were two cars on this list that were similar in styling to the BMW M1, we've had the 8 series and now we have this, the i8, which was actually inspired by the M1 homage concept car first shown off at an Italian car show at Lake Como in 2008. You can really see a lot of similarities, especially around the rear wheel arches and of course the general profile. It's a very different powertrain to the M1 though, a 1.5 litre turbocharged in 9.3, which is combined with an electric motor to produce a combined 356 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 4.3 seconds, pretty fast for such a small engine. In its class, this is by far the most successful car out selling all of its competition by a huge margin. In fact, if you added together all the sales of all of its competition, it would still be less than how many i8s were sold. It started as the coupe, but a convertible example followed shortly after, and either way, it really is a very nice looking car with those butterfly doors, with a lot of road presence compared to many other performance BMWs, which can often fly just a little bit under the radar unless they're in a shouty spec. For me, this car is proof that car manufacturers can build cars outside of their norm and still be successful. I'm sort of glad the BMW didn't follow it up with an immediate success as I think this will cement it as a classic in 20 to 30 years time, plus for the foreseeable future, the fact that it's a hybrid makes it a very usable sports car that should be able to be driven regardless of regulations for a little longer. These have come down pretty well in price recently and now you'll find them starting anywhere from around the £27,000 mark, with many examples sitting at the 33k mark from around 2015. Some owners have suffered from overheating issues with these and others have had battery issues over time, but the general sentiment is that these are very reliable cars overall. The main issue with these is that you pretty much have to get main maintenance and repairs done at a BMW dealership, which means they get to dictate the price longer term. Taking the top spot in this video is a car that I would say is excellent value for money right now, maybe not immediately likely to gain classic status, but the BMW M4 competition has a lot of performance for the money, with its 3 litre twin turbocharged inline 6 engine producing 443 brake horsepower, taking it to 60 in 3.9 seconds. I've not driven the comp, but I have driven the non-comp, which really impressed me beyond what I originally expected, and the comp came along mostly just to help that car handle a little bit better. I did find that with the non-comp there is a lot of power and often not always the agility when turning corners at pace, which the comp is supposed to help with. The M4 arrives when BMW split out the coupe and convertible versions of the 3 series to the 4 series badge. While the previous generation M3 did come with that very cool V8, which definitely sets it apart from other generations, as we know BMW are an inline 6 brand and they often make more reliable, more performant cars when they just stick to what they know and give us a nice inline 6. It comes as both a manual and a DCT automatic and having used the DCT it changes nicely and it's not too aggressive when you don't want it to be then is aggressive when you want to send it. I feel like the non-competition example you go for because you want a nice road car and the comp you go for because you want to take it on track a couple of times in its lifetime. And that's because it had more power, new performance focused suspension and a bunch of lightweight parts to take the weight down. If you want to get into one of these they start at around the £24,000 mark and you'll find plenty for under 30k from around 2016 with reasonable mileage. The main things that are likely to go wrong on these are the crank hub, valve cover allowing leaks through the gasket, oil pan gasket leaks, oil filter housing gasket leaks, much of which leads to burning oil, and the main issue I found on forums, the air conditioning is known to go wrong, or at least be a bit difficult to work out. Now I'm sure many of you watching this video are massive BMW fans, and that's great, but if you want to see a bunch of Porsches instead, then click up here, subscribe as well down here. Thank you for watching, thanks for the page for their support, and I will see you in the next one.